Hi everyone. Welcome to the Tridian Docs Roadmap session for Connect 2021. I'm here with I'm Joe Pearman, Senior Product Manager for Tridian Docs, and I have with me here Chip Gessinger. Chip, could you introduce yourself? Hey everyone, I am the manage the global Tridian Solutions team here at RWS, and I'll be talking a bit later. Thanks, Joe. Thank you, Chip. So just to let you know what's coming up in today's session. Um, so first of all, I have a recap of what is Collective Spaces. So I'll be talking quite a bit about Collective Spaces, which is a new environment that we have uh, for subject matter experts to get the benefits of, of the power of Tridian Docs. Uh, and also be going over some recent release highlights in relation to Collective, collective Spaces. And after that, I'll be going in some depth to the development themes for 2021 and 2022 and looking at the roadmap ahead. So first of all, Collective Spaces. What is this and what's it for? It's really coming out of the need we see in the structured content field, where before you used to have quite a large team of, let's say, structured content experts, structured authors, and they'd be highly trained. And sometimes this still happens, but of course, increasingly we're seeing in our traditional customers, traditional markets, but also in newer areas, that customers are expecting that the subject matter experts themselves also contribute content and play a key part in authoring and reviewing it. And it's not that they're happy to just simply enter content in a little form, press a submit button, have it disappear into a, into a black hole somewhere. No, they expect to actually have some control over the content to really help shape it, not only on an individual component or topic basis, but actually the whole content set, the, the whole book, the whole structure, if you like, um, the whole deliverable, they need the ability to shape that and work with it in some depth. And previously, this wasn't possible, of course. Um, so nobody had this on the market. And, and this is something that we've actually created. And also the ability to truly federate across your organization, the ability to review content and input on this highly structured and governed material. So have we, how have we done this? So one of the new environments is called Draft Space. And this is a, an easy, simple editor or deceptively simple, I should say, because it actually gives you quite a lot of power as a subject matter author uh, to edit structured content yourself. It's not just about simply inputting in a word style interface, which it does. It's also about adding some sophisticated features like content reuse and so on, working with the whole structure of your document and so on. So it's quite some power in a simple interface in draft space. We still have, of course, a strong role for our traditional users, if you like, the, the power users, those using Publication Manager and the client tools, where you still need these tools to curate the technical structure, make sure processes are working and to overall govern the content. So that hasn't gone away, but an increasingly large body of people can, can author content themselves from scratch in draft space. We also have a need for scalable review across the whole enterprise, where previously you might send out a PDF or a Word file and have it come back in multiple different instances with comments all over, and you might end up having to track them in an Excel sheet or something like that. Now we have a unified environment where all of the annotations, all of the suggestions go into one database and you can keep track of what's going on, the input, authors can see this, they can act on it, and together you can collaborate on this, on this carefully governed content that we enable. And there's also an API for accessing these annotations uh, straight from the database as well. And you could build custom reports on them and so on. So this is all functionality that we brought out in Tridian Docs 14, and we've had a few releases in quick succession to, to add features to this, to really polish collector spaces overall. And the latest one was in December. So that was Tridian Docs 14 SP3. And just a quick rundown of what we had in that release. So we improved the ability to work with cross-reference links from one topic to another, where previously you had to dive down through folder hierarchy and find exactly the right topic in your repository, be confident it was the right one, and then add the link. 
Now you can pick it from an easy view of the whole publication. You can pick the right one, you know it's in context um, and it will go in. And as you put it into the content, it will now display the actual link target title. So quite a friendly way to make sure you're, you're adding the correct links. If you would like your subject matter authors to also work with data relationship tables, it's not for everybody, but if you have that need, then you can configure draft space to be able to do that now. And that's still quite a friendly way to do it. You can add multiple links in the same way through this nice new link picker, and you can move links to various locations in the table and basically exactly control what's going on if you have that need and if your authors would like to work in that way. We also have, in response to customer requests, a new browse repository dialogue with a simple search for content, whereas previously you could only browse through, now you can search as well. And various usability enhancements, drag and drop content within a topic, a clearer design when you're commenting on exactly the same section of text. Uh, we've made the resolution notes when you resolve an annotation, we've made them optional now, so you don't always have to do, so that's configurable at the, the whole instance level. Another one to remember the last folder location. So if you're inserting an image or a comref, then previously it would forget where you were and you would have to drill down through that folder hierarchy and now we remember where you were. And lastly, we've also added a custom sidebar. So in parallel to the outline view, the properties view, the properties panel and so on, we've added a new custom sidebar, which is configurable to basically use as a blank canvas uh, to connect to a UI of your own devising, um, use any of the kind of API uh, resources available. So you could use this for things like a, a simple report on content quality, perhaps. You can also use it uh, to allow users to directly publish from within draft space. Say we put in a button, you can add a button um, that will trigger a certain, let's say it's a compare publication versions PDF that then they could generate from within that custom sidebar. And I wanted to mention a number of these improvements come directly from the community ideas. So the STL community, community.stl.com. And we read that and we take notice of it. Um, and it's a great place to, to put your own new ideas and to have discussions around them, to, to really flesh out the use cases and so on. And so while we don't do everything immediately that's in there, we're certainly paying attention, certainly listening. And the remember folder location in particular, that was one that was a, a community idea that we've, that we've implemented. So please do keep those ideas coming. So Chip, could you please talk a little bit about collector spaces in practice? So how are you seeing customers actually adopt this? What are the benefits that they're getting from it? And what different kinds of customers are you actually seeing using this? It's been a really exciting time since Treating Docs 14 and Collective Spaces were released. Um, and, and we've seen a number of existing customers upgrade and add in and purchase Collective Spaces, uh, primarily in technology companies. And the use cases we've seen, Joe, have been around extending into subject matter experts. The exciting area I've seen is for knowledge base articles or extensions that information that should be part of the tech uh, docs kind of circle have nicely fed into uh, treating and docs. We've also seen it very popular in manufacturing, especially semiconductor, large equipment manufacturers. They have very large practices of SMEs who are reviewing content and need to have online access to it. And 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 collective spaces have proven to be very easy to learn, especially around review space for commenting. Some newer customers we're seeing are in regulated industries. Uh, this is in financial um, and, and uh, life sciences type of organizations who have a very large collection of subject matter experts. And so I'm happy to say just about every new customer that has adopted Trading and Docs last couple of years has included collective spaces for those kind of users. Finally, we're also seeing extensions now into retail and entertainment organizations. Interesting enough, they have a lot of content that is written primarily around policies, procedures, and so forth. And it's been rather unstructured in the past. So Collective Spaces is proving very nice for their subject matter experts because they also have things like content reuse and translation challenges that we're able to solve with Treaty and Docs. Thanks, Joe. Thank you, Chip. That's great to hear. So I'd like to move on to the roadmap theme. So what's coming up? What are the 
key themes that we're working on over this year and next year. So the first theme, make authors and editors more productive. So this has two aspects. Um, it's got an aspect I'll talk about in a minute, which is uh, the new web client organized space. But it's also got some key improvements, some further improvements to collective spaces, particularly in terms of reviewing and looking at changes. And we're looking at this in a couple of ways. So first of all, on the right hand column where sometimes customers would still like to see a full compare across different publication versions in the PDF kind of style with, with change bars and markup and so on. So what I just mentioned about the custom side panel, uh, this is a way now to do this according to the needs of your own organization. So organizations have slightly different needs about this, um, but now you can configure that to, to hook into your own publishing pipeline, use the backend API, customize a UI for doing that, um, and you can certainly do that. But this is, we wanted to take things further than that. And we've got this document history capability in draft space, an optional capability uh, to go into a particular mode to see in detail the recent changes. So technically speaking, the revisions in a particular topic version. And this has been quite popular and customers have been asking for this also for reviewers. So not just authors in draft space, but saying in review space, we'd like to see this as well. And so this is what we're releasing this year is document history also in review space. So you get that powerful view on all the recent changes, who did them, when exactly, and what they consist of. That's in the short term. In the slightly longer term, so really more kind of next year timeframe, we're looking at an improved inline view of the changes for, for both draft space and review space. So same kind of principles. So the revisions on a topic version, um, but looking at making this a little bit more in line and less modal, uh, so something more intuitive. And I'll show you a little preview of that, how that could look in a minute. Another common request has been an accept change button in the same style as Microsoft Word. And it's an obvious request in, in some ways and deceptively difficult because of course we're working with highly structured content which has inline tags, meaningful tags, and you don't want to kind of disturb these or break these. It's got joins between different blocks and so on. So quite some complexity. So simply accepting a change that a, a suggested change that a reviewer has made is not quite as simple as you might think it has been. But we've been working on this together with our partners at Fonto XML, and we've cracked it now. So we're adding an accept change button into the product, and this is gonna work kind of 95% of the time. The 5% when it doesn't work is when it could truly do some damage to your content structure if you accept it. Um, and in that case, the button will be grayed out uh, and you can still copy the change as now directly into your source content and add it as you like. But for 95% ish of the time, uh, you'll be able to directly accept the changes and just save you a bit of time and making the product even more usable. And then another common request. So one of the aspects of kind of traditional track, track changes is not only seeing the changes, but being able to focus on which part of the document should you really pay attention to. That's a, that's a key aspect of this, a key use case. And we've worked on this in a particular kind of idiomatic way for Tridian Docs, where we say, what is the fundamental mechanism for knowing um, what status is something and should I pay attention to it? And it is, of course, the, the statuses in Tridian Docs. So if I'm a reviewer and a topic is in, let's say, to be reviewed status, I know I probably should pay attention to that. Or let's say that I'm a subject matter author and I've been assigned um, a bunch of topics to author and they're now in draft status. So I should pay attention to things that are in draft status. And we're now bringing in some highlighting in the outline view to directly and some filtering so you can focus on exactly what to look at. And let me show you how that's going to look. So in the outline view, we're going to have these labels, for example, here to be reviewed, and they're going to be directly alongside the actual objects they relate to. So you can quickly scan through and see the things that are relevant to you. But what if you've got many, many objects, let's say a thousand topics or something, and you want to quickly filter to only the ones in a relevant status? Well, you'll be able to do that too. So you can pick a certain status and filter straight down to it. So you only see those topics in that status. 
you'll still be able to see the hierarchy. So if you've got a map hierarchy, you'll know where you are in that, but it will filter to only the specific objects um, at the, the kind of the leaf level, if you like. So that's coming up in our release near the end of the year. The accept changes button that I mentioned earlier, here's how it is. So simple accept changes button uh, to directly implement the change in your source content. And I mentioned a hint of the future, kind of a more inline UX around the document history capabilities. And here's one idea for how it could look. So a kind of a tabbed basis where you're either reviewing or you're going into this document history view. So less modal, uh, less of a jump from one context to another, uh, but you still get this nice uh, view of exactly the changes and even closer to the content than they were before. So, but that's coming up a little bit later. It's kind of next year timeframe, as I mentioned. So that's all collector spaces. What are we doing? So these are these are really exciting innovations, and I know a lot of this came from uh, feedback from existing customers who've been using collective spaces. So I want to acknowledge that, as well as the innovations from from our team. So really good to see. Fantastic, thank you, Chip. Indeed, yeah, this is based on a lot of meetings with customers and carefully listening to to feedback on improvements. So, but the whole theme was about authoring and editing productivity, which although collector spaces is an increasingly important environment, it's not the only environment in Tridian Docs. And one key aspect is the web client, the place where you can manage folders, manage uh, settings if you're an admin, uh, you can do things with translation, of course, and all of this kind of stuff. So it's in need of a bit of a refresh, I would say, and this is exactly what we're working on at the moment. So first of all, the most noticeable thing, of course, is the, the UX refresh that we're working on. So you see now this is in the nice graphene style, as we call it, the graphene design language that's common across all of our products. And as we're implementing this language, we're looking for opportunities to, to slightly stream some of the tasks that streamline some of the tasks that you used to do to make things slightly easier, a little bit more simple on occasion. So the new web client is a key thing that we're working on, and this is for next year timeframe. I should also mention back on draft space, we're looking at putting a spell checker in. Uh, so a spell checker that will work natively in, in draft space as well. But back on this work on the web client, really this is some work that will enable us to build faster in the future towards more browser-based functionality. There's some key work behind the scenes as well that we need to do on this to really refresh the way that the whole web client worked. Uh, but this is really building towards a future where we have more and more functionality available directly in the browser. So of course it's multi-platform, you can use it on more different operating systems and easy for anyone to access and so on. So this is a direction we're going in. It's uh, step by step. So looking at that web client, first of all, the new organized space, and from that we'll be able to build in quicker, subsequently, new browser-based features. So a second theme, very much tying into this, update key architecture. And again, as I mentioned, this new organized space is helping us remove some older code that would eventually block customer IT teams and uh, certainly becomes more difficult to maintain and replaces it with a much more secure and modern approach, as well as the new UX that we saw. And indeed, so this new web client will be the basis for future browser-based functionality, like reporting and insights and reuse recommendations and such like. But this is a key part. It's a bit of infrastructure. Uh, so you'll see the new UX, of course, in terms of new functionality, that's going to be coming a little bit later on, I would say. Uh, but this is a key building block towards that future. And as part of this, we're making it more cloud friendly, but also more upgrade friendly for all of our customers. Um, so if you have Trinian Docs on premise, these changes will also make upgrades smoother and easier. We're also looking in the slightly in the medium term, I would say, at more centralized tools deployment. So even for the desktop client tools, making those a little bit more easy to, uh, to deploy and manage from a central location. And another key step, again, kind of medium term, looking at 2023 for this, allowing multi-factor authentication, modern authentication standards in general, and also building out a new customer-facing API to make it much easier to customize Tridian Docs uh, using kind of modern API standards. So the op open API is a specific standard, kind of self-documenting, a modern way to work, and this will be the new way to extend and customize Tridian Docs. 
So another key theme, expanding connectors and integrations and working particularly with our connectors team on this. So something I didn't mention about the December release, Tridian Docs 14 SP3, was that with it, at the same time, we released a connector to Viva, so the document management system, enterprise content management system, uh, very common in, in life sciences, for example. And in a similar way, we're working on a SharePoint integration. So both of these allow you to publish into these particular repositories smoothly and seamlessly from Tridian Docs without having to kind of download files and then manually upload them to the other system. So as I say, the SharePoint connector for publishing is coming out quite soon. And we'd like to hear ideas of other connectors uh, that you would like into which kind of repositories for publishing or just connectors in general. So perhaps it's more out of box integrations for external data sources. I mean, for a long time, many customers have uh, plugged in, let's say, master data management systems or product information management systems. And it's perfectly possible to do that through the metadata binding mechanism. But what out of box connectors would be nice to have so you don't even have to do that, that little bit of integration work. Please let us know. I mean, the ideas forum is a, a great place to do that. Perhaps it's even kind of reporting and business intelligence tools, you know, tools that you can get the data out on all of those content relationships and have a look at your content reuse and so on. I should mention as well, looking back to a proof of concept that I'd that we'd shown at a previous Connect con, uh, conference, where we're looking at really analyzing the reuse patterns of the content and trying to look at what's the return on investment of your content reuse. So that kind of proof of concept is still quite valid, it's technically somewhat challenging, but you know, this is a this is a route, this kind of connector route into business intelligence platforms is a way to look at this in the near term. In the longer term, I'm looking at doing this in a more productized way, um, a kind of a, a bigger knowledge graph approach to it all. It takes a little time to get there, but uh, watch this space, I would say. But please do let us know in the meantime, what kind of out of box connectors would be useful to see. So the final theme, and perhaps the most ambitious theme that I'd like to bring in, uh, driving customer success with semantic AI for content and also for authors and editors. So what is this semantic AI? Semantic AI is really a solution to the problem of disconnected content and data. So of course, everything is APIs these days, various components of a system, they all integrate with APIs. And if we're connecting with external systems, um, for example, other systems in your enterprise, other data sources, other content repositories and so on, it's all through APIs, of course. And this is great to a certain extent. The problem is, of course, if you're just pumping around bits of data from one place to another, they can be somewhat lacking context. There's no universal way that you have to describe what does this thing mean? Who's it for? What's it about? What can I do with it? So that can make it difficult because, of course, if you're dealing with metadata, you have to look at kind of complicated crosswalks and really specifying what means what in this system that maps to this other system and so on. It's a big problem. And sometimes this disconnectedness, it sounds a little abstract perhaps, but when you're looking at somebody's knowledge portal, website and so on, and when you're finding perhaps it's a little bit difficult to get from one piece of content to another that you think should obviously be related, well, this is another manifestation of the same thing, that in some way, some way we're not really connecting data meaningfully together. Another thing, um, quite a few of our customers are now interested in ch chatbots and conversational UIs and interested in how it's possible to drive such systems. And of course, with our structured content approach, you can certainly quickly get a handle on the relevant uh, components that you would like to put into such systems. But again, there's something perhaps lacking a little bit in terms of the meaningfulness. If your conversational AI, if your chatbot knows something about the customer intent, as is the big focus, of course, these days, how do we derive that content, that intent? How do we match it to the actual content? It can be a challenge these days. And this is what we're looking to solve with what we call the semantic layer. So really a piece of infrastructure in a way that builds intelligence, that tags content with what does it actually mean? What's it about? And really helps connect it. And so when we look at all the individual applications you might look to drive, um, so whether it's kind of chatbots, 
whether it's content that you're importing about understanding it better and so on, a way to connect this meaningfully to the real world ideas and objects that the data represents. And this is really across the whole of Tridian, I should mention, and looking at our language integrations as well that we're looking So quite a big picture for this. So it's quite abstract. So let me bring it slowly back down to what's happening concretely in the near future. So first of all, how do you build one of these semantic layers? And it's really based on technology that's become quite prominent in recent years, been around for a while, but um, become quite known as, as knowledge graph technology. And it's used by major tech firms such as Google and Amazon and so on to really knit together data with what it actually means in the real world. And in particular, one standard that's important in this area is known as SCOS, the Simple Knowledge Organization System, which is a recommendation of the W3C Standards Organization. So this is something that's a strong customer requirement to work with SCOS and an industry expectation these days. In fact, if you're doing a project uh, for the, the Netherlands government and it involves anything to do with knowledge graphs and taxonomies, they expect you to use this SCOS system. So, so we know that some big customers are already working in these areas and quite excited about our direction with the semantic AI. And in fact, it's something that we've been talking about with our taxonomy task force user group. Well, it's a, a self, uh, self-governed self user group, I should say, but we have the opportunity to listen to this user group and really get some great input towards the product. And this was a document of some various requirements that the user group had come up with. And a couple of the requirements, compliance with international standards, particularly the technical standards of SCOS. And this is exactly what we're building into the product. Also, interestingly, the ability to support metadata tagging, not only after the fact, for example, in the delivery platform, as so often happens, you know, trying to retrospectively put some intelligence into your content, but actually to do it during content development to allow authors to do it. And also to provide some kind of automation of that, you know, making it easier for authors to, to do this tagging, so to auto classify content. So let's have a look at what exactly we're building into the product to do this. And this is just a little taster in this session. We have another session specifically about the semantic AI in, in, in Connect. So I encourage you to look at that for more detail. But one of the aspects, of course, it's tagging content, it's tagging content with the taxonomy that it relates to, and in this way, future proofing it. And then looking at improving author and editor productivity. So first of all, that it's easier to actually tag content. And then so it can help you as an author, for example, find duplicate content, topics that people may have written before and you don't want to recreate, but find them and reuse them. And then another important aspect is how do we improve the end user journey with the content? You know, when they're feeling it's hard to kind of navigate through uh, to find what they want in the first place and to navigate to meet their end goals with the content, how can we improve that? And we hear a lot about things like findability and personalization. Essentially, it means getting people to the content that they need. It's as simple as that. And this is something that we hear from customers all the time. So how are we enabling this? So for example, uh, let's take a fictional insurance company trying to produce uh, content, not only for in consumers of insurance products, but also internally for the, for the employees who support those people looking for insurance products or who draw up the regulations and so on. And so if you're looking on this knowledge portal, so there's a working prototype that we built, if you're typing in something like car, well, how can we help that search for car insurance? And here we're doing it by a concept-based search suggestion. So I, although I've typed in C-A-R, I'm getting matches that are nothing to do with that, but they're conceptually related. So here I've got auto, I've got vehicle, for example. And of course, these are concepts that mean the same thing, but they're not the same string. And so this is something that this whole, whole semantic AI and taxonomy approach enables here and something we're building in the product. Also faceted search, which is a common feature, of course, lots of faceted search out there. But when you can truly tie it back to your organizational taxonomy, to your own knowledge model, um, it's centralized, it's more powerful, it's much better than doing just a little specific work on a faceted search that only works in one context. 
and this is something we're building out as well. So directly enabling the content delivery to match back to the way that the content's been tagged in the first place, ultimately driving a better user experience. And again, it's that sense of allowing a user to very, very quickly drill down on exactly the content they, that they need at that time for their current task. But looking at this idea of a user task, a user goal, Often, particularly with Tridian Docs content, it's not as if you're going to get your whole answer just in one little snippet or on one page of content. If you're installing a big piece of machinery, let's say, if you're putting into practice an accounting regulation or something like this, you're unlikely to get your whole answer in just one paragraph. You might need different content types, actually, different pieces of content across this knowledge portal. How do you quickly get recommendations to go to these different parts to, uh, to really complete your journey with the content and make your decision or uh, complete your goal? We're, we're also using this taxonomy and semantics approach to do exactly this. And this is more kind of next year timeframe feature, but very much working on this uh, to enable those taxonomy tags and the facets that we've just seen to also drive content recommendations, as you can see here at the bottom of the page. And then, of course, it has to be practicable for your editorial team and authors to actually tag the content in the first place. So you might have a wonderful taxonomy and lots of things you want to do with it. You might even be able to build a nice end user experience with it, but it's just such a challenge for authors to tag the content in the first place. And we're built, building this directly into the product. So the auto tagging, the tagging by the authors that we saw in those requirements, for example, from the taxonomy task force, building it directly into the product here. So this is draft space again. And you see here on the lower left, uh, sorry, the lower right, we've got a button that says get tags. And that's exactly what it does. So based on the content we have here in this topic, um, it goes by an API to a service that will actually check it and find relevant concepts from your taxonomy and input them into the relevant field. And of course, you always get the choice. Do you accept them? Do you take them as they are? Uh, do you remove some? Do you choose to add some more? You can do that yourself. Uh, but it's based on quite a clever statistical analysis that's not just matching on the individual strings that are in the content, but again, looking at the concepts behind it, looking at the related terms, looking at things that seem to mean the same, even if they're not direct synonyms. And it's working with all of that. And by the way, we're also doing this on a batch basis. Uh, so that you can select, for example, in any list view um, in the client tools, you can select a bunch of topics, let's say, in a folder. And you could say, please go and get tags for all of these. And it will come back. It will do the same thing. And of course, it's still perfectly kind of controllable by yourself. You can go into a topic. You can add or remove tags as, as you like. So that's what And of course, doing. Joe, that means that it will also work with Oxygen and X-Metal authoring bridges through the properties dialog that you're seeing here. So it's important for traditional publishers or authors to be able to have this capability too. It's pretty exciting. Thanks, Chip. Exactly. Yes. And as you get more confident with the auto tagging, you may choose to say, simply do it automatically every time I check in a topic. And that's something you can configure. It's up to you. It may not work for all organizations. Uh, but given that the results will be quite good, and as you improve your taxonomies, they'll get better and better. Uh, so you can choose to enable that option. And as I say, you can always go through, you can always edit it, you can uh, drill down on a big taxonomy very quickly through uh, this kind of dynamic filtering that as you type a term, it filters down your taxonomy to the relevant bits you might want to add in there. So that's on the tagging side. So just a quick look now at the roadmap coming up. So I've talked quite a bit. I've mentioned a release at the end of the year. I've mentioned a next, a next year timeframe. So how does that actually look in terms of roadmap? So as I say, at the end of this year, we're looking to release a uh, Tridian Docs 14 SP4, which has exactly this AI assisted optional taxonomy feature. It has the review enhancements that I mentioned as well. For example, the ability to focus and filter down on objects in exactly their a certain status. We're looking also at that spell checking function in draft space. Uh, the SharePoint connector I mentioned, that's coming out. One thing I didn't mention is there is also a connector uh, to language clouds, to the language cloud product, uh, which is coming out by the end of the year as well. And also, of course, those content delivery, the search and smart facets that we talked about, those are coming out. 
And then some of that more fundamental building work that I talked about, the first results really coming out next year with Tridian Docs 15 and the new organized space that rebuilt admin and power user web client with a nice UX there. Looking also at the view on inline changes, um, so the document history type feature and looking at how we can improve that also for next year. Um, making some critical changes under the hood, work that actually is building towards that new API. We're not going to make it a public API just at that point, uh, but the fundamental building blocks we're starting to put in as well for next year. Looking at what we can we do to improve the connectors overall, you know, out of box connectors, what more ones would we like to put in? So an idea also perhaps better integration with external workflow systems. This is another idea, but very much looking forward to the ideas that are contributed here. And then finally, on the content delivery side, as I mentioned, looking at how we can make those content recommendations so users can reach, can fulfill their whole goal with the content and get all of the information they need quickly. Those smart recommendations, we're building that also for next year. And Joe, for customers interested in a Tridian language cloud, uh, we're looking at adding in demonstrations in the coming months. If you're interested, please feel real free feel to reach out to me. Uh, Chip Gettinger, probably by the May, June timeframe, we'll have the integration in a demo mode to uh, for folks interested. Thank you, Chip. Fantastic. Yeah, definitely encourage customers to do that. Um, and also, you know, if you're more, more interested in anything you've seen here, please do contact Chip and his team or your account manager uh, to learn more about this. So thank you very much for joining and I hope you enjoy the rest of the Connect presentations.